Hello, and welcome to another suspiciously delicious episode of Junkcast. I am your snuggy clad host of Cutlery, Cozy Spoon. And here again is uh, Pyrus Terran. Hello, everyone. And we may or may not have a mystery third co host, but that's up in the air. So we're just going to soldier on. <laughs> <laughs> but for those new to the junk pile, Junkcast is a quick and dirty DIY audio effort to talk about what's buzzing around the Void community, as well as dish on all the delectable comic battles and members of the Void uh, community whip out. Speaking of hip and happening, we have a bit of exclusive Junkcast news to start off with before we get into the nitty gritty. And it's from none other than our own Void Sapphire Deji. And she wanted me to for forecast uh, Voider of the Month. So what is this and why do you care? So Voider of the Month's main aim is to shine a well-earned spotlight on Voiders who stood out as bona fide members of the community. And what does bona fide mean? Whether by going ham on comments and crits, slam down some rad battles and tourneys, or just being a good egg in the Discord channel and being helpful. Contribution takes on many forms. And we feel it's high time that we celebrate that. To be that Voider over there. A T-Vot, if you will. <laughs> so staff will be rotating throughout the year to see who picks uh, that Voider of the Month and when. It'll always be a different one. It'll never be the same staff member consecutively. So, for example, Dawn could pick the Voider of the Month for November. And then the next month, it'll be Pyrus picking the Voider of the Month. So just as an FYI, the criteria of which staff member considers to be Voider of the Month material will change. Like maybe Dawn is more focused on the volume of comics that that individual has done for the month. Whereas Pi may be like, oh, I really like the fact that this person is commenting on every comic battle and I really enjoy their feedback. That's Voider of the Month material, as to be a kind of an example. And I hope this little peek has whetted your appetite for things to come, and you should see an announcement on the official Voidcast Discord breaking down this funky first feature soon. But for now, let's get on to the junk. Junk cast, that is. Yes, let's. Okay, so our first couple of junk cats spotlighted this year's Armageddon and subsequent inspired member collabs, but now that, that dust is settled and the death and devastation of big old tourneys is done with, it's time to get into the spoopy spirit by oogling some scar matches. And I managed to wrangle three of them, which I'm surprised that we have so many scar matches for this month. I feel that everybody's like feeling, feeling their oats. So we have a grand spec in total of three, right? We do have three, yes. All right, give us a quick little rundown first for those who are new to Junkcast or maybe just Void in particular as to what Scar Matches are. So, Scar Matches are uh, higher stakes uh, comic battles that we have here in Void. Uh, the basic aim from each side is to, as the name suggests, scar the other opponent with some kind of uh, physical alteration that by the end of the comic means that the uh, artist has to change their character's uh, character sheet to mm -hmm. uh, comply. As scars can be anything mundane, like a simple hero's scar across the eye, or it can be something wild, like uh, putting their brain in a robot body, and now they have a robot body. Mm -hmm. And it runs uh, a gamut, right? It's not like there there aren't limits to what a scar could be. Yeah, as long as it's something that forces the artist to... Uh, change their character sheet if they lose uh, it can count as a scar yes indeedy and it, I, the thing that i love is that the caliber of scars definitely change with the times i know the example that you just gave that was the go-to for old void everyone got an eye scar <laughs> yeah eye scars were very common there was a it was a hip thing to do it can get really uh personally brutal where you would have characters uh carving their names into the other character's forehead Mm -hmm. and there's a couple of characters who have uh, headbands exactly because of that. <laughs> headbands were very in back then. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Yeah, for yeah. me, the scars that I saw way back when were the eye scars and losing an entire arm. Like, everybody was really into limbs and eyes back then. It was, uh, it was simple. <laughs> when you had but to I like to think real quick. I like that nowadays people are getting more creative and more story driven for sure. Yeah. And one of the things that makes this high stakes uh, besides that change is that the opponent really has no obligation to uh, give you a nice scar. They could yeah. be nice if they feel like it, or they could be brutal if they feel like it. And it's completely uh, within their prerogative 
that's uh, kind of half the excitement of the scar yeah. match it's like you can go one, one of i guess a couple of ways you can have it be a surprise on both ends and just wait and see what you get or you can contact the person via dms and be like hey we're in a scar match uh, you know and you can ask like are there any limits if you want to limit yourself or say like you know what am i allowed to do or what can i do to help your storyline i mean it can be either or any there is no wrong way to do a scar match so long as you follow the criteria right now for those of you that are interested in doing scar matches and do want to take the safer route where you speak to the <laughs> member uh keep in mind that there's no rule saying they have to abide by whatever you guys agreed upon yep so if they decide to be a jerk uh, <laughs> and go against whatever you planned uh Staff can't really help you there. It's uh, one of the give you a false sense of security, and then what? Bam! You lost a toe. It's one of the risks you take when you go into a scar match. But I think nowadays people are definitely more focused on like I want to do a good comic story, and I want the scar to reflect that. I think the the yeah. void times of I'm just doing this to be you know a stinker. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> really seen that. Yeah, a lot of folks are trying to get uh, scars in that help progress the. Uh, uh, the character's story forward in some fashion. Yeah, for sure. But I digress. So, let me see what we got going on. We're going to be talking about Anselin versus Hannah Rahal, which is Snowy Moth and Bobo's side of the comic, both sides. Mm -hmm. The Final Feast, which is Eli versus Ray and Blue, which is a double scar match. Pi, can you tell me what the difference is between a scar match and a double scar match? In a double scar match, both characters are going to get a scar in both sides of the comic. So you basically are going to decide what kind of scar your character will get as well as the scar that the opponent gets. So just so I understand it, like say uh, Eli wins this round, the scar that they inflicted on themselves and the opponent is the one that becomes canon. Yes, exactly. And I gotcha. And what's the difference between that and like a regular scar match? Well, in a regular scar match, you don't necessarily have to scar your character. Um. You just gotta mess up the other guy. Side of the comic, pretty much. You just gotta <laughs> mess up the other guy in some fashion, but you don't have to mess yourself up. Dig it. Some folks like the double scar match because it sort of gives both uh, characters some kind of an equal loss. It depends, right. it depends on who you ask. I think uh, Don has joined us. Oh, Don, have you joined us? Nah, I'll fuck around and find out. I hate scar matches, actually. Fuck them. <laughs> you know what? We hate scar we're banning them by popular demand. Those don't exist anymore. That's right. What is what is this fake news on this cast? Get out! We're talking scars. Donular demand. Donular. That is fucking awful. <laughs> well, you caught us at a great spot. Also, welcome, Don, our third mystery. Uh, what would I call you? What do you want to be called? Call me a bad bitch. All right, our third bad bitch. Who's here on the junk cats for today? Glad <laughs> to be here. Alrighty. We have a bunch of crits and a bunch of comments to talk about. Why don't we just crack this open and start with Anselin versus Hana? Yeah, sounds good. Pie, fire us off. Or don't pie us off. <laughs> Pie is fucking dead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Am I, <laughs> I just heard that out. I love that silence. I heard, I heard pie. I heard a lot of noise, uh, silence, and then I heard fucking dead. That's your Whoa. mascot now. It's just a cricket <laughs> <laughs> singing Smash Mouth. So we're starting with crits. Yes, we're starting with Antolin versus Hana. Okay, so I'll uh, start with uh, Jade's side. Um, visually, uh, I would say it's top notch. One of your uh, best works on the, one of your best works on the site, Jade. Honestly, the first page especially um, shows that you put a lot of uh, uh, love into working out those backgrounds. Story is easy to follow. Um, no major complaints on the uh, on the uh, comprehension of things. Uh, one of my uh, cons with the overall comic was uh the pink elements that were coming off of uh hannah uh in her beast form uh very they were very 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 flat pink 
uh, especially compared to the rest of the shading work that you did with the rest of the comic. So it came off as a bit of an eyesore compared to the rest of it. A little distracting, almost like it was an unfinished element. Uh, I also had a concern with uh, Anseline and the and the uh, end of the story. Given that Anseline's meant to be a heroic, uh, it seems that she really easily forgives Hannah for the murdering and destruction. It's uh, because she's she, hot. That she I'm herself sure. witnessed. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> She herself witnessed it, so um, as a heroic character, that part doesn't necessarily track for me. There's something um, when it comes to these, you know, werewolf-style characters that have a, a monster transformation they can't control. If you're an adult human being and you know that you have an un uncontrollable monster form, I think it's your responsibility to do whatever is in your power to keep from hurting people, even if it means exiling yourself from society. Are you saying um, that Hana is a responsible adult? I'm saying Hannah oh. is old enough <laughs> to be responsible, to be a responsible adult. What kind this of is full fucking advertisement? And and, and this sounds like a no smoking. And Angela would, uh, I think, would know that as well. Fair, fair. I, I think it was just a little too easy the forgiveness. She wasn't even like in a uh, a bound cage or anything to make sure she doesn't uh, freak out or anything like that. Maybe she's just an irresponsible adult. Open. Maybe she's just like, YOLO. <laughs> Y'all gonna get eight. <laughs> uh, those are my thoughts on, on Jade's side. Alrighty. I have thoughts as well. Uh, I'm gonna say Jade because saying Bobo would just be too confusing. So, hi, day. Let's talk about your side. So, where are my crits? Oh, they're right here. <laughs> So I know that this comic deals with the aftermath of Arma as Anselin waits out Grey and Hunter's ruckus in her egg mall, safely tucked away in the woods. I like that you're kind of going with the linear storyline. I'm a sucker for voiders doing linear storylines because I like feeling like we're going episodic and going, you know, last time on Dragon Ball Z. It's just, I don't know. I just think that's really neat. What I don't have anything against the sort of you know, baddie of the week doesn't have a linear storyline. I think those are great too, but I just like seeing the development of a character this way. So I'm glad that you did that. I also agree that this is your best comic to date. It's not only completely complete, it is nice and colored, and you really just went ham on just the shoujo aspect. And I know I've uh, mentioned that in the comments that I left you on the battle. It's just, it was so pretty. And I like the fact that you're really embracing the heroine trope with Anselin's costume design. This is the first time I think I've seen this design in a battle, or maybe I just haven't been following your work. I'm not sure. I just thought it was really neat. It wasn't, I didn't expect it. It was really, I don't know, I dug it. Also, it's really good to see, a, a, I, I don't know if I would call Hana evil, but it's the best form of good versus evil showdown from like somebody who's wearing all this like holy, you know, I'm a good guy gear to some one who's essentially a rotting character. They're all about decay. And I like that that was sort of uh, heralded with the way that you stylized everything. I dig it. Uh, by way of crits, the lack of sound effects. Like, we had a whole lecture about sound effects. And you have all these great moments where there's this, there's this distortion of Hana's roar on the second panel of page nine. But then the effect feels really muted because there's no accompanying sound effect. And that, and I think the level of cute on your comic was really off the chain. Like, who wouldn't fall in love with Anselin if she looked at you the way she does at Han on the last page? But I also <laughs> agree with Pi that, like, she took one look at the monster in human form and was like, I'm gonna kill- Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> but that's it for my crits. What about you, Dawn? Do you have thoughts? Uh, yeah. Let's go, lesbians. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> so, Jade. Hello! Um, so visually, as everyone else has said, your best comic. It's, it's great to see more work from you always. I feel like I can never get enough of your artwork, so it's really pleasant to see, you know, a complete comic from you. And can never get enough, really. Can't get enough. Stop putting ass on my Discord! Okay, so the story itself is straightforward with its premise within its Slay the Beast structure, and I actually, I'm pretty endeared by it with the the fact that it's a modernization of an often considered medieval tale, when really that sort of theme goes beyond medieval. And I also find it really charming that because of that sort of theme in mind, that it does make me think that Anselin's 
armor is very knight-like, very medieval, mm. sort of ties in like all of that. And it has a very interesting parentheses, neither good nor bad, end parentheses, upbeat twist. It really feels like that at the end, the lesbianist aside, uh, it's it's one of the comics that kind of tells us to wait and see for more with the questions that it provides us, especially with the fact that in the end, Hannah is asking questions that encourage us to ask questions, which is when Anselin uh, mentions, you know, her people and Hannah's like, your people. And then we're like, wait, your people. And then it doesn't continue. Cons. So the act deserves proper composition and such that establish the character placement and flow. There are a lot of zoom ins, especially for Hannah's beast form, which sort of seemed almost partially cropped at all times. It does unfortunately take away the tension. The energy of the scene is gone when I'm not getting the quote unquote full picture of these quote unquote money shots, such as in page eight's final panel. You want in that whole monster body. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. I knew it. Shut up. So, you know what? We're not in the RP server. We're here. We're here. Okay. So, in, I'm trying to be professional here. So You were doing so well. I'm so sorry. You ruined my life. Okay. So, in an argument of convenience versus complexity. I would strongly recommend that, at least for comics on short deadlines like these, to really juggle complex such that include a multi-dimensional plane for scenes that involve showing the audience where the characters are placed and possibly for the money shot panels where, like such as, let's say, when a strike actually makes its hit. Uh, but you can also crop those into those quote-unquote convenience shots. But the main question you should be really asking yourself when you're drawing these is what does the body language of both of the fighters tell us and what is the power dynamic now? I would definitely recommend studying fight scenes and I would definitely say anime because they really make good use of the composite shots between my neighbors fighting upstairs and the between the complex and convenient shots. And Thanks. another con, that's right. How many paragraphs do I have? A lot. I have notes. I took notes. Okay, so. <laughs> Just rustle a whole bunch of papers. Just, I have notes. <laughs> <laughs> I have notes. Okay, so the writing is straightforward, but I'm missing the visual explanation of how Anselin gets from point A to point B, particularly when transitioning from the beginning to the middle and the middle to the end. For example, when Anselin states that she found traces of Hannah's magic this morning and tracks her via that magic, we don't really, as an audience, see that. We, we aren't really shown that. We're told, but we're not shown. If anything, what we are shown is Anselin's incompetence to find Hannah any sooner, as shown on page two, when she literally fails to see this necromancer, aka Hannah, who is literally mere feet away from her, hiding in broad daylight. This is an issue of, once again, showing versus telling, vice versa, ver telling versus showing. And there's, of course, it's hard to juggle between the two. I would have, I personally would have loved to see Anselin vent her frustrations, notice some trace of magic, and then go, hmm, thinking emoji here, hmm, what's that? And then we can transition to the nightfall scene. Especially since when you show on page three, when she is talking about searching for more magic. We are literally shown that magic in its pink streaks. I wish we were shown that before when, you know, she's venting her frustrations. And, but otherwise, great comic. Loved it. I hope I can see more work from me, Jade, and hope to see more of Anselin in the future. Let's go, lesbians. Also, a uh, belated congratulations on that win. Shall we move to Snowy Side? Yeah, let's um, go. Yeah. All oh, right, uh, Pi is back from the dead. Go for it. Pi is <laughs> fucking asleep. I had, uh, I had two last notes. <laughs> oh sure. For uh, for this for Jade's side, um, uh, adding on to this to the thing about Anselin not uh, not caring as much as as I think she as I think she should have about the death part. Noticing that the transition from page five to page six, she sees uh, Hannah. Uh, kill someone and her immediate response is, so you're the one causing all the damage to my buildings. I mean, the building's more important, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
to speak to what Don was saying about action scenes, especially with big monsters, you want to get uh, you want to get the whole or, monster. At least one or two <laughs> uh, shots where you have the full monster in in range. And in general, you want to be able to pan out so that the reader gets a good idea of what the battlefield looks like. They can map it out easier in their head and get a better feel of uh, of where everyone's moving and, and what the stakes are in the fight for each character. Agreed. So, moving on to Snowy's side. So, um, I thought the visuals were mostly strong. I, I think it had a very good use of contrasting forces between Anselin's sword and Hannah's decay miss. I think you played that off really well. Uh, I liked your writing uh, for the characters. I thought you had better character writing in general uh, mm. versus uh, versus the opponent. Uh, Hannah's uh, has a clear indifference to the damage that it, she inflicts here, uh, and it makes more sense to me to, to see that. And then, as well as seeing Anselin take this active, aggressive shift to try and prevent more casualties after nearly becoming one herself. I think that tracks better. Uh, as far as cons, the art is, uh, it's, where it's good is pretty good, but it's not consistently strong. And it starts to suffer from uh, page three onwards. Mm. And the battle sequence especially, I think this is where uh, you tripped, where, where Jay did better. The battle sequence is confusing. It's hard to understand what's happening for most of the panels. Um, and the end of the fight's kind of unsatisfying as a result. I know that uh, writing and drawing action can be difficult, and what makes sense for us in our head may not necessarily track for others. So uh, in the future, I would recommend finding, if you haven't done this already, I would recommend finding a couple of members whose opinions you trust to show these action sketches during the drawing period uh, to make sure that they can see what you're seeing uh, so that you don't end up with these uh, this action scene that ends up feeling a little tepid because you're not even really sure what's happening from one panel to the next. Those are my thoughts on that side. Excellent. I also have thoughts. Let's get into them. So, yeah. Anselin for 2020, right? I love the fact that this fight just has her go, <laughs> oh, man, I'm so messed up. I need to run for mayor. I don't know. I just really love that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a great setup, and it was a great confrontation. But the reasons for why the fight ended for me were personally weak i like i was so like leaning into my chair reading this because the pair is clashing and hana kind of has anseline on the ropes and dead to rights like she won that fight and then she just stops like she's like All right, I'm, I'm done i'm out of here and it's explained later during anseline's speech that hana was playing but i didn't really feel that that was portrayed in the comic i thought that this was a serious battle and i'm not sure uh Hana's mental state when she's in that monster form, if she's sort of mindless or she has, you know, sentience that's similar to what she is when she's human. But I wish there was a more visual tell to show that she was essentially just toying with Anselin. And that would have uh, better informed Anselin's frustration with like, I can't believe that this is going on and it needs to stop, you know, because people are just getting played with and I'm running for mayor now. <laughs> But I, I do like that that was a motivation. And uh, congrats on you, just like not only giving a very interesting scar, but also giving the character great motivation to possibly have the artist use that moving forward. And I really hope you do, Jade, because I just think Anselin from Mary would be a great shoe in. And those are my thoughts. I'm, I'm eating fruit gummies. Okay. Oh my I'm goodness, gonna... swallow and let's go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So. So, hi, Snowy. Okay, so, your art style, just, just, what? I'm trying to talk. <laughs> what do you want from me? Continue, <laughs> continue. No. I just want to hear I more of your it. gremlin growling. <laughs> I, I hate John Cass so fucking much. Okay, so, <laughs> so, hi, Snowy. Okay, so. <laughs> No, just shut the fuck up! Okay. I'm muted, I'm muted, no. I swear. You are not! Okay, now she is. Okay, so. Art style. Very endearing. Always loved it. So, shut I should stop reading the chat. Jay Cat's bullying me. So, I love the way that you draw women. Not because I love women or anything like that. No. Yes. Uh, I greatly think that <laughs> how you, uh, 
Your art style definitely complements Hannah's playful demeanor here in this battle. And swallowed my fruit gummy. I absolutely love Anselin's hairstyle here. Love you too, J-Cat. So your story is also straightforward, playing to its beats and not stretching itself out too far to complicate the story more than necessary. You really did make every page, even though it was just four pages, I really do think that you made them count. So I don't think there's really any extraneous page needed to explain anything. I mean, besides the fact that the other people said that the battle could be better. I mean, I get it, but that's what So <laughs> I love Pyrus Moot yourself. So I love Hannah's playfulness at the end. And the background chatter really does help to build up Anselin's words. And finally, her scar. I think it was really great lead up. And I was like, oh man, what the fuck does she look like now? How fucked up is she? Um, and likewise, I really do believe that the scar does build up Anselin's confidence and determination. It's kind of, in a way, I, I wouldn't say it's rare, but I think it's uncommon to really see a scar match where when you give your opponent a scar, you have the opponent's character end on a rather positive note of confidence or determination or looking forward to the future rather than leaving them purely distraught or horrified by how they look or what has happened to them. So like this feels, I think it's pretty neat. I think it's pretty neat. Uh, in terms of uh, any cons, I could, I could, re I can at best reiterate what others have said, which is to say, I won't. Uh, because why? So at best, I can only say like maybe little nitpick stuff, such as um, that bird's eye view shot when Anselin is running towards Hannah, her left thigh is missing, but that's just minor stuff. You lose a thigh sometimes. It just be like that in this world. Uh, but really, I just have nothing else to say. Uh, yeah, no, just fuck around and take away your... She ate it! Bitch. Okay, but that's just me. That's me. I'm good. That's all my crits. Lovely. Okay. Shall we move okay. on to the next battle? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Good job. Right. So, Snow. Yes, definitely good job. I do want to try something just to, I don't know, I'm going to experiment, Tate. If you guys love this, we might keep doing it. If you don't love it, we'll toss it out with the junk. But I wanted to give a quick little synopsis of Final Feast, just so we're all on the same page and you know we're hacking and slashing when we're critiquing. Critiquing? That's a word. Critiquing. <laughs> okay. So we're going to go with Buggy side first. So with the dust of Armageddon settling, Blue goes in search of Ray, only to find that she's fallen victim to, I'm going to butcher this and I'm so sorry, Eli Mikolov, an undead ghoul who's given into their hunger for flesh. With Ray's life on the line, Blue possesses a marauding ghoul in order to stop him. And in doing so, all of them get more than what they bargained for. Hey, yay, I got it right. Thanks, Buggy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Pi, hit it. Okay. Um, I don't have too much to say about this, uh, about this one. And I, I'll, I'll say that's a good thing. It, uh, it's, uh, you got a clever idea here using the blue for the color of the blood for the story. I thought that was neat. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely points for that. The artwork in general is some of your best. You have some good sound effects. I like what you're. I like what you're uh, testing out with for the uh, texturing. Um, one uh, one con of mine is I did not realize in the beginning that that was actually Ray that was being chased, and the story starts just so abruptly. It felt like it was missing a couple of pages. It was a bit disorienting to mm. start with. Uh, but other than that, um, I didn't really have any other uh, any other complaints for this one. It was a nice, simple comic. It, it was drawn uh, well, especially well. Um, in your case, you improved a lot from your last ones, and uh, good job with that. I'm away, satisfied with the meal. Let me see my thoughts now. Buggy, I love this comic. I think that. Uh, comments that you've gotten like namely i the crits on this are so great namely by petricor and sai like kind of put the words out of my mouth i know that petricor says that you nailed it with the spooky atmosphere and the sketchy shadows and darker shitty backgrounds were all perfect choices for this kind of comic and i agree i think that you should definitely keep going with this style because i think it's i think your strongest 
I don't know. I just thought it was really graphic and great. Let me see. I, I think that your usual work is usually hyper shaded with color values. And I don't know, maybe I'm just not a fan of color. I don't know if that's you or that's just me. We'll, we'll talk. But this dark look is not only festive for the season, seeing that we're in October, but it really sets the scene for the bad times that are going to go down. <laughs> so, Eli's story. This follows kind of the same formula that you have in previous battles, which is, I eat people, and I feel bad about it. And while I think it's okay for a character to fall sort of into a wallowing cycle where they don't progress forward, I think that there's a way to write it in a way that at least story-wise, it progresses the character even if they're staying in the same spot. Because you have, like, these really great images uh, when Blue possesses them where, you know, he's chained to a wall. Why is he chained to a wall? You get this montage of memories that we don't get any context behind. What are those memories? Those are the things that I'm super intrigued by and the things that I want to know more about. But we're stuck with the only information being, well, I'm Eli and I eat people and I feel bad about it. And we already know that. And I think that that was touched upon on some of the comments that you've gotten. And I just, there, there's so much background to him that I personally know because I've spoken to you and have asked things about the character. But I think the Void community as a whole only has this comic to go off of and it doesn't give us much. And I really want to know the things that you've hinted at more than what I already know, which is that he has guilt over consuming. Let me see. That's all I got. Don, eat that gummy and join us. Shut up, I'm eating cashews. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm hungry. Okay, so. Buggy! Hi! So, your comic here. I honestly think that it was one of your... Hello! It was one of your visually best. Mm -hmm. I definitely love... Hello? What the fuck? Who's we hear it? you. I'm agreeing. Yeah. Mute your fucking mute your fucking mic. Oh my gosh! I had enough of you. First and last so. dawn appearance on this cast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the texturing on this comic is fantastic. I think it really does help to establish the nitty and gritty of the setting. <laughs> and <laughs> fuck, I really shut down Cozy. Sorry. <laughs> and how the story, how nasty the story is supposed to be. So. The the harsh hashiness, though the resolution of the texturing, the resolution of the textures itself is a little bit iffy. I mean, it doesn't really take away from my experience, but on the second read, I was like, these these look like they're at pretty lower DPI. Uh, either way, it's a great atmospheric addition. Uh, and I really do like the combination of ray and blue in this battle and... Uh, the sort of and how this their scar is what it is from what i'm guessing i'm gonna guess the scar here feel free to correct me if i'm wrong it's so ray and blue's powers combine to form a new prosthesis for ray yes or no feel free to just feel free to correct me fuck me up uh i was right okay so i naturally do have a bias for characters who have abstract prosthesis prosthetics because I mean there's so much you can do with characters that have prosthetics it's a really fascinating subject so I'm really fascinated in the machinations behind this scar and really it does give interesting potential for how Ray and Blue are gonna you know interact in the future and what how much it impacts their shared prowess um in terms of crits gee I don't fucking know because Cozy stole mine so that's right I'm not gonna go on junk cast anymore after this. This is gonna get me kicked off. So um, I'm, let's say that I'm guess guesstimating, guessing and estimating how many pages make up the beginning, the middle, and the end. It really feels like the beginning of this comic was solely it, it was just page one, and that's causation for the lack for a lack of buildup, a lack of buildup to the tension and the shock that happens by page two. So that's very, very direct. So as a, as a reader, I feel like I'm thrown into the middle, per se, of the story. And it sort of rushes the pace of the storytelling for me. However, 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 
I can completely understand that you are uh, that you and uh, Fly Team were under time constraints during this battle. You, Pyrus, as a global moderator, you were supposed to censor that for the gore. So, considering that you had time constraints during this battle, uh, I can completely sympathize with the urgency to rush the uh, to rush to the point of your battle, having that inability to give that quote-unquote abstract concept of a breathing room that the audience needs. You just didn't have enough time to do that. So I can completely understand why this story does feel a little bit rushed in the end. Uh, I would strongly recommend to, t to try m to make your overarching storytelling more linear, which is to say to take Eli's previous comics into consideration. This is sort of me reiterating what Cozy is saying. So. I, apolo I, I apologize in advance if it just sounds like I'm spitting words that Cozy has already said. But if we look at Elijah's previous comic versus Talon, both sides end with Talon agreeing to help Eli dealing with his appetite, his ghoulish nature, uh, versus Holden Shark. On one end, you have a display of Eli struggling to control his tendencies, and you have another side where Holden is befriending Eli, regardless of which side you consider canon for yourself as a writer buggy. The lack of regard for these previous battles that count as Eli, Eli's encounters in Void, his history, it really does take away the opportunity to amplify Eli's struggle as a ghoul, despite this, like, which is to say, like, you could be taken into account d despite the support that he's been getting as a character through other characters, through Holden or Talon, uh, you could be reiterating that he that he's you know struggling despite all this that his development is and his themes are struggle just like the talent emoji um and the main theme of your writing in the end is as cozy said he loses control of himself and he feels bad but i don't want to focus on that it's a, it's a good starting point and what i want you to consider when you're writing his future comics is what comes after that what comes after feeling bad? Does he just get up and does he go home and call it a day? Does he continue to wall in his breakdown? Does he, is there ever going to be a point where he decides that enough is enough and that he needs to change? Or will he change slowly? Will he change fast? These are things I would love to see you consider in the future as you write Eli. He's got potential and you've got potential and I would love to see it uh, really come out in the future. And that's all for me. I have two more things. Because I don't know if I mentioned them, but again, sound effects. Loved them, loved them, loved them. I think that you had a lot of fun with them. And I know that you were asking people for feedback on how they looked. And I think that some of the feedback that you received were well established in your pages. I would say my only nitpick was that I wish the same was done for the word bubbles. I think I mentioned that before uh, in the comment that I left you on your battle, that they felt too clean against your really nice and hyper detailed uh, gritty inky pages. That, and I personally love the fact that you made the blood and all the viscera a blue color because it kind of enhances the ghostly vibe of not only your opponent, but even Eli himself. It just felt very, I don't know, spooky. Also, I did want to spotlight Putrid's com comment in your battle where they said that Eli chasing Ray on all fours was creepy AF and loved it because I loved it too. I think that your use of silhouettes and spot blacks was just chef kiss for sure. Is that all we got for Buggy Side? That's it for Buggy Side, I think. Yeah, all I'm right. good. A good effort, Buggy. Thank you so much for letting us, you know, just chit chat and take a bite out of your battle. Let us move to Flighty Side. Okay, so, uh, Flighty, well, full disclosure, I've been a fan of Flighty's art since the very <gasps> beginning. And even now, I think the I think her art is honestly pro-level. I have said that to her already. <laughs> I think she should go and make a webcomic already. Is this an uh, art crush here? Are, are, we, are we revealing an art crush here on Junkcast? <laughs> visually, uh, this comic <laughs> is no different to me than the others. Uh, still great. Still keep going at it. Uh, I'm getting. I'm being told that she's already making a web comic. Excellent. Okay, she knows what's up. So uh, I liked seeing Blue go aggro. I thought that was refreshing. 
I know she's gen that generally she is a proactive character, but it's cool to see her particularly angry uh, and see that side of her shown for something that means a lot to her. I think uh, she was justified in her anger, uh, given the situation, and I uh, enjoyed rooting for her in that moment. Um, I did have some problems with the story. I had a lot of confusion with pages two or three, and even after some rereads, I wasn't sure if it was that Eli was grave robbing and ate the dead bodies, or if he was the one who uh, killed all these people and ate them uh, a, a while ago, and he just ended up there after Armageddon again. Um, mm, that's and, it a good made point. Me, and that made me confused as to what exactly Ray was going to show Blue at the cemetery. And I get that those graves are the graves of Blue and her friends, but on the first read, I was wondering if I, I had this idea that maybe Ray was trying to get Blue to meet Eli. I wasn't quite sure. It, was, it, it wasn't uh, clear to me. I felt like a scene was missing for clarity. Uh, that the graves was what Ray was going to show Blue, which is what I assume it was the intention. And then they saw Eli just happened to be there. Um, I'm also uh, not a fan of the way Ray takes uh, the attack by the end. I understand that you're portraying... I understand if you're trying to portray uh, someone who's used to living in somewhere as dangerous as Void City, uh, and that Ray would be desensitized a certain level to life and death, life or death danger. But I, I, genuinely, believe, I genuinely believe that having a human being eat the flesh off your face is not really on the same level as a mugger with a knife or even a meta with explosive energy powers or a demon that's trying to eat you. You know, there's a- I like how you said that. There's a difference between uh, a lion attacking and eating a human and a human attacking and eating a human. And the human psyche uh, gets that there's something very wrong when they see mm. that, when they experience that. Uh, it's particularly disturbing. So um, I don't feel like she has been through enough to shrug it off, shrug off an attack like that just yet. No, I kind of ag agree with you on that. But let me start from the beginning, and then I'll dovetail back into that subject. So flighty. Uh, I think my first takeaway on the first page, I, I'm so torn because I love your level of detail. I love your backgrounds. I love that you've given your version of Void City kind of its own personality. But page one alone leaves me wondering if you should give the pages room to breathe. I mean, it's neat to see it all packed together and see these very congested scenes. But I feel the content you're portraying is so small. And the panel is so small. I'm, I don't know. I just I want to see the city spread out. I want to see them, you know, taking the tacky, the tacky. Man, I can't speak tonight. The taxi, you know, down a winding road as they head to the graveyard. And I know that some of these, at least, I I personally do it to kind of adjust for time. It's like I can't draw a whole cityscape. Let's let's enhance that, you know, camera. But I, you have such a talent for cityscapes and backgrounds. I'd like to see that kind of zoomed out a bit for us to appreciate it. Uh, let me see. I think that Badger made a great point in their comment crits about adding detail and personality to the uh, the graveyard, which I think of all people, Badger is a great person to suggest, go detail on the graveyard. <laughs> they gave some really good points and I think I saw a nod to an old Void character in the bottom right with the coffin with the cross on it. What was the name of that character, Pi? Do you remember? That's Ripley. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional, but I like that nod. Also, to talk about the trauma of a deface getting eaten off, I personally thought it was muted, and I added that to my comment. But in an exclusive junk cast verse, I actually got a response from Flighty because they responded right away. And their response sort of amounts to uh, the extended oppression. Uh, experience by the character, which is being stalked and imprisoned, is more traumatic to the character than a physical attack, or at least that was uh, my takeaway from your response. And I, you would know your character better than I would. And I, I got to take that at face value, but I kind of am leaning with Pi here, in which 
there is something to be said about someone stalking you and having that buildup of that anxiety or being imprisoned where you're not being actively attacked. You're just being contained and having to deal with your own thoughts as you're in solitary. And then someone actively inflicting pain and doing something as invasive as eating your face off. That just seems like something that I agree that you, I'm totally with you with not wanting to have the last pages just be her going, oh my gosh, poor me, blah, blah, blah. Because I think it'd be a great character spotlight to have her deal with these inner demons and this trauma on her own. And when her friends come in, just sort of snap back to attention, be like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm totally cool. This is, this is fine. That would have better informed like, yeah, this was, this was a bad time, but I want to, <laughs> I want to save face uh, in front of my friends. Yeah, I, her, I just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I, I'm just agreeing because yeah, like you, like, uh, like you're saying, it's not just, it's not just a, any normal attack. It's, yeah, it's human, they, the way you just the portrayed it was so gnarly. It just, I was left coming away from the page like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad for the character, and then I felt kind of like flat-footed when the character was like oh this is fine it's not a decoration i'm good and i was just like is, is she good i don't i don't know i don't know if she's playing the straight or if she's doing it to kind of not worry her friends i i didn't really get a temperature from her i got more of a temperature from uh eli especially with the way that you portrayed his expression on that uh sometime later sort of montage where he's talking with talon and you know he's hugging himself and he's sort of glancing down at his forearms because that whole like i guess you would call it a possession and that infliction of pain which is another physical eatery thing was like traumatic for him and he was just like oh man i mean he looks shaken and the fact that on the same page comparatively you know ray's looking at herself in the mirror and smiling going yeah this is cool i don't know it it didn't sit with me but i'm going to take your feedback into account and that's all i got Okay, uh, so, hello, Marty. So, as Pyrus has said, your style is definitely, it's, it's, it's a goodie. It's a fave. It's very, it sticks out. It's, it's not something that I've actually seen in my few years on Void, so it's very refreshing to see. And I think that you've shown improvement in your backgrounds and in your expression game. Your, your expression game has improved, and I... I Specifically, I really do love the look of Blue's face on page two, panel six, because it really does just just by that angle, it really does look like there's some actual dimension added to her head shape here, just by the empty acknowledgement of an under the chin area. And I mean, if that sounds fucking weird, I will take the L here. Um, the execution of Eli's scars was definitely a favorite here. It's absolutely sort of haunting in a way and it really emphasizes the immorality of his corpse cannibalistic ways even if he cannot control this diet that he is stuck with he it, it makes me really think about how he has legitimately not considered mediating in a modern humane way especially considering how void itself is very loosely morale the void city is not held by the same constructs of uh humanity of morale as any other city would so finding a quote-unquote humane way in the city might not even be impossible well i don't know that's just me uh in terms of cons uh stiff anatomy in terms of the light-hearted parts of your comics um it's totally fine but during the intense or action focused scenes where you're ramping up you're building up the tension it is your weakest point. The flow is lacking and the poses feel pretty robotic. And it's because your stylization of the human anatomy is based on shapes like rectangles and squares rather than exploring into curves, finding a line of action to emphasize. And I'm totally not, it, it, this is a crit that I really feel flipping on because I really do enjoy those more cubic cubism styles but i don't know it just the action just feels really static and when eli tackles 
Ray, it, it doesn't really feel really intense or, oh shit, it just feels like it happens, period. There you go. Um, in terms of Ray Scar, uh, uh, I, I do agree with Pyrus and Cozy with there there's there's a discussion to be had between the difference of mental scars and physical scars there's a difference between someone pressuring and threatening to say that they will hurt you and someone who is already hurting you um but that aside uh i sort of want to get into the accuracy of ray's uh scar which is a part of her face got chewed off uh whether let's say so Doctors and nurses avoid, feel free to correctly correct me. But like if her skin was her skin or even just like skin or flesh and muscle, whatever, if it was ripped off, she shouldn't be able to make the contort her face to make the expressions that she currently does, at least without not without egregious pain, because the muscle is ex exposed and needs to heal. And also she should technically just be like straight up missing an eyelid or something like that. Severity such as that. Um, I would even say just things such as skin grafting. Like if when her muscles are stretched, how bad do they ache? How much blood is there to be had? How much sensation can she even feel in her face besides the blindness? Can she still, can she still smell or something like that? Uh, no, I don't think so. She would be in pain, but she can still make a face. Yeah. Actually, she said um, she said that she's blind in that eye in the comic. So, so uh, yeah. Um, but it just feel I do love the idea of the scar, face tearing. Of course, I'm gonna like it. But it feels like uh, I don't know. It it her dialogue and sort of her reaction. It doesn't feel accurate to the heavy trauma that facial horror is. Facial horror, especially. This is the face that everyone is going to be seeing. This is what you're going to see. It, it it doesn't feel like it emphasizes how traumatic and how horrifying and how guilt-ridding that can be. It makes it look more cool than it does accurate. And uh, that might be a really harsh critique, so I apologize for that. But it, it, it's honestly how I feel. Final thoughts. I do want to talk about uh, the sound effects that you had, only because we had a stellar lecture not too long ago. It, they and I'm saying this with as much uh, intentional. This is a compliment, but they were so gross. Uh, just I I'm looking at the images that Pi is sharing, where Eli is just freaking eating, and you just see the the slurp slurp, and I'm just like, oh, that's so nasty. It really like turned my stomach and I thought it was just really neat to see especially as she like goes out and that's the last thing that she sees looming over her I was like oh that's awful that and it was great to just see uh Blue get some cool agency you've kind of built up the character uh possessing people especially if those of you have followed Flighty's work and the Arma collab and how they had to go through like an underground cavern and she possessed a, a frog demon the fact that she possessed uh ray is this the first time that she's possessed her and what does this mean for them as friends and what does that mean for uh ray in her ability does that change their dynamic does she, has she positively or negatively influenced blue i really hope that you explore that with your next battle but all in all this was just a really great read Okay, I believe that's it. Shall we move on to the final one? Unless you guys have final thoughts on this current battle, either side? Uh, good job, both of you. Keep it up. Yeah, good job! Yeah, for show. Sure. Alright, we are moving to Amuse Bouche, and mm -hmm. I wanted to discuss Putrid Side, because talking about myself is kind of weird, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but Pi, you go first. Putrid uh, Side. <laughs> putrid Side first, okay. Whew. Future story, in my opinion, is A++. <laughs> I think it's got great pacing, great visual storytelling, fresh, original from beginning to end. I think it has a perfect ending shot, and I really just loved it. I honestly, between that and between 
the uh, Beyond Battle, I honestly believe that Putri is one of the best writers of the newest generation of Void members. Oh, that's high praise. Um, ren- uh, art-wise, rendering game is very strong, uh, but your character art and your background design aren't quite there yet. Uh, I think uh, if you just keep at it, uh, it'll catch up with your rendering and your writing. But uh, one of my favorites um, in the past couple of months, by far. Mm-hmm. And I think the comics uh, really reflect that. People just really piled on to this comic. And the fact that it was done a 28-page comic in three weeks is like a huge endeavor. And I think the community recognizes that. Yeah, absolutely. I got nothing else to say, really. <laughs> You're just happy. <laughs> Another good meal. All right. I also have thoughts. So this is just me, and this is me as the opponent speaking to a fellow opponent. Going up against my character, who is Remy, who is already a difficult character to battle. Like, I fully admit to that. And especially as a first official battle, and especially as a scar match, I just got to stay right now as, like, officially a junk cast exclamation that is a brass balls no fear power move so congratulations to you uh let me see where do i even begin i see in some of the comments that you've received that your palette was kind of muted and too samey that it kind of blended your characters and your Mm -hmm. environmental elements together so we weren't sure what we could see i really would love to see some harsh black spot blacks or focal points with some, you know, intense highlight to just sort of give some attention to pertinent aspects of your comic and your pages, because there are some great moments here that I think would have been better served with more intensity to your inks and going heavy in that way, or going heavy with like a swell of color, because your colors are very desaturated, and that's kind of like my kind of comfort zone, but. In ex- reading other battles and speaking with other artists on the community who are great with color, you really want to punch up those moments. And the best way to do it is with color, if you're I going to be what, using uh, it. I think what helps uh, your page is cozy. Mm. Uh, compared to oh, don't want to talk about me. We're not talking about me. <laughs> no, it's about, it's about Putrid's. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> is that um, it, goes back to, it goes back to the character and background art, which is, uh, which is on the weaker side for Putrid. And uh, especially with a uh, line definition, I think uh, mm. they would benefit from experimenting with thicker lines. Yes, oh, that's a good I point. That would definitely help with the muted palette. And I think that's one of the things that helps your comic. Or yeah, your we got in general. We got to get dummy thick on them lines. Just, just go full inks. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. So I know that Cecil's whole deal is that he doesn't talk much, and is an insular character. And but it's clear that he has thoughts. It's clear that there's so much more going on behind that blank face. And it might help to pair that with some sort of subtle expression or the silent stares paired with some inner monologue or things that he's thinking about to better inform the scene. Because like you have this whole moment where they're tailing Remy. And I think that it's a great visual montage. And you have this moment where he purposely bumps into him. They have an exchange where it's just a look. I would love to know what's going on in his head. I would love to just get at least just a peek of that inner thought process or monologue as to him deciding like, yes, this is the person I'm going to go for. Because I don't think it was, I don't think it was that clear with just a silent comic, which I'm personally a huge fan of silent comics, but I think that silent comics afford or lend themselves to more panel count just to better explain what's going on since you don't have the luxury of word bubbles. Let me see my notes. What does they say? Also, just to completely be a hypocrite and speak against myself, because I just said, oh, I'd love to see just a little bit more expression. The fact that there was no expression here made, I think, what page was it? That page where we get a full and utterly unsettling smile from Cecil in the car where he says, culinary curiosity really stand out in a super duper creepy way oh my goodness i actually when i read that i leaned back from my chair and i was like (laughs) let me see uh 
for Michelin stars, though, when it comes to the comments here, to the full course meal that was Monday's critique, that was not only helpful, but was written like a full ass foodie review. So if people have not read that comment, I fully recommend going down and reading that. And that's all I got. I'm sure I'll have other thoughts once Dawn is complete, but let's hear what they have to say. Yeah, that seems to be a, ba a pattern, huh? I say shit and then you're like, oh, I got more shit to say. Okay. Um, I didn't actually, I, I didn't write a note for this battle, so this is pure, purely off the brain. Uh, Pyrus said that you might as well be one of the best writers of this new generation of Void. Assuming the new generation is 2018 onwards, I would strongly agree with that. Um, I think you've made your presence very clear with this comic, especially against a veteran heavyweight champ previously, such as Cozy. Um, the writing in your comic wins the battle for me. I, I definitely prefer your writing over Cozy's. And I, I I enjoy the writing. I enjoy the visuals. I would definitely agree that the backgrounds could use more spark to them. I would, I would, however, definitely I would disagree with giving uh, Cecil Cecil. Uh, I would say Cecil. Cecil. Uh, it's Cecil. I, would, <laughs> I would disagree with giving Cecil that um, internal thought monologue. That sort of, I feel like giving him any sort of internal dialogue that really sort of, uh, where he's telling us what he's doing or what he's planning, I think that actually does take away from his character. He's a silent person. We're supposed to sit there like, so what's he gonna do next? I don't, I feel like it give, I feel like giving him that internal dialogue gives too much personality to a character whose theme is to pretend that he has a lack of personality. I feel like the silence is the strength here. And I rather than suggesting that um, you add that internal thought dialogue, anything like that, I would rather see you experiment more with the power of silence in your comics and also try to include the power of environmental storytelling. Have the environment and the people tell the story for Cecil. Um, there was this one anime that I watched where th there is an entire scene between the protagonist and her romantic interest of the episode where they were entirely silent, just purely interacting. But you can understand their body language. You can understand their thought processes because in the back, you can hear the audio of a uh, radio of a radio drama that's, that's a romance sort of displaying their thoughts in a way without them without the radio being the characters themselves you're having the environment tell you what's going on without the characters having to spell it out for you and and that's a really hard thing to juggle because in comics people do kind of want you to spell things out for you i mean spell things out for them but i really do like the fact that you're kind of writing against the wave by doing the opposite and i think it really does encourage that critical thinking and and uh looking back and rereading and trying to understand what's going on rather than just being like oh this happened I, I really like it i think it really does encourage a deeper understanding of what's happening especially when we have this character who is cecil who is he's a lot he's he's a lot by not saying anything even with his beyond vow he is a lot by him not saying anything yeah, I, I really love it. I would love to see more of your stuff. Also, um, can we talk about the fucking scar? Okay, so <laughs> I it's just I, I'm talking a lot here, but it's because I'm really impassioned by the fact that once again, that like Cozy said that Remy is a difficult character. He's a pain in the ass to write, and he's a pain in the ass to deal with. He's ass, he has a pain in the ass power. Fuck Remy, but he dealt with. It in a way that I did not consider before and it made me go I am so stupid why didn't I think about that before I'm so fucking stupid <laughs> and and then yes the page where he's like water's hot 
can't go in. And Lou is like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's cold. I went, woo! Loved it. Stellar. I think I, I love the scar, not just be, because of how you uh, or orchestrated it, but also because I'm a big sucker for the mental effects of physical scars actually being shown rather than shrugged off. I, I think that um, the mental effects are really important to consider. And I think that you really, it, I think that with that end of the comic, you really did give sort of a note of, of hey, this is sort of the mentality I think Remy would have. You're, you're free not to go with it or go with it. But I would, you know, a, an additional part of the scar is just him being traumatized mentally by the water. And I just, I think it's great. I'm, I'm going to have to, oh, go ahead. I'm going to agree with Don here uh, when it comes to uh, Cecil's uh, portrayal as a silent antagonist. There's, mm. a, there's a level of, uh, there's a bit of a Coen Brothers level. Uh, oh, I was in, just about to say that. Yes. <laughs> in, the, in the writing here with, uh, with Cecil, with the environment actually feels uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of No Country for Old Men I get. A I was just about to say that, Hive oh, Mind. <laughs> And the um and one of the things that made Anton figure the antagonist of No Country for Old Men uh, so terrifying is that you know that he's thinking things, but you don't know what he's thinking, and True. you don't know what he's going to do next. Granted, think, this is this is two against one, and I com you guys are totally making me lean your way, but I'm still gonna kind of tug of war it because <laughs> while I think for this comic and possibly the next one or even the one after that, this silent treatment is like compelling. But I, if I can just scroll up here in the Boyd lecture notes, I forget who said it, but they said that could only take you so far. If every battle is going to be Cecil really silent and not giving the characters anything to work off of, it makes me wonder where that could go with their I, development. I can agree with that. And I'm just, I, I think as a, as a first showing, as a first battle, this is super impactful. The silence is definitely impactful. And I'm with you guys on that. You've convinced me, but for long term, it makes me wonder, like, is every battle going to be silent? Like, for me personally, I read this with that building silence getting me excited and anticipatory, like, is he going to say anything? And once he started talking, it just made it creepy. Like, mm -hmm. the, the long pregnant pause until he said a thing is what made the words that much more impactful, at least for me. Also, oh, those are my final, I'm adding and tagging on thoughts. <laughs> but yeah, a super duper congrats to uh, Putrid. This is not only a fantastic first battle, at least for me, but it was a fantastic scar match. And I had so much fun with this character. And it was so much fun to see you interpret the character. And for those who want some behind the scenes, you know, commentary and junk cast info bits, uh, Putrid was in my DMs just... Uh, tossing memes and going, Cozy, I have a question about the character. Cozy, I want to ask about this. Cozy, I want to do this. And it was such a great collaboration. And mind you, we've said in the beginning of this drunk cast that a scar match, you have to come away with a physical scar, but the way you go about that is, you know, no holds bar. You can do it anyway. But the way that we did it is that we DM'd one another and we said, okay, do you want this to be a surprise for you? Do you want to, you know, have it have an agreement of what limits are? And to Putrid's credit, they said, well, I, I'm cool with it being a surprise, and I'm cool with most of whatever. And I offered my sort of suggestion, and they said, oh, I love that. And they gave me just the tiniest hint as to what their scar would be. And for me, I really didn't mind. I was like, do whatever, mess him up. It'll be cool to see someone actually mess him up, so go ham. And I really dug the scar because I think that my opponent understood my character. The whole his whole deal is physical damage doesn't really affect him. So the fact that this was sort of a psychological scar uh, attributed with something vis you know, ma physical manifested on his body was just really neat. And at least for me, win or lose, I can't wait to explore that. <laughs> uh, it looks like Don is not able to speak at the moment. <laughs> which is unfortunate because the next part is... <laughs> Talking about uh, your side, cozy, and that needs not that needs both Don and I to mind talk you. Before before we dive into this, I just want to say I probably 
won't say much. And I had sort of like a tug of war feeling about this because I really wanted to feature Putrid's comic. But I find it really weird to have like my own junk caps where I'm talking about myself. It just seems kind of oddly masturbatory. So I'm glad that I have two co-hosts in which you guys can speak your pieces. And if you have questions, I'm here to answer. But if not, that that's all good. So say your things. So I'll get started since I can talk right now. <laughs> Speak away. <laughs> <laughs> Concerning your side. Uh, well, art, as always, is pro class from you. I think the gore was uh, effectively unnerving. Um, the character writing was great. Uh, there, there, there isn't much I can stand out part because the, honestly, you, you pull it off so well visually uh, from beginning to end. You have a really strong grasp of your style. Anyone can look at your art and you know say, "Yep, yeah, that's cozy it's drawings right there." I like what you did. Uh, I like what you did with uh, with blood in this uh, comic from others and the gore and viscera. <laughs> I could tell you did your you did your homework. Okay, another background tidbit. I need to clear my browser history because I looked up so much unsettling imagery. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, it was a very physically manifested scar and I wanted to like do it justice and make sure that it was at least anatomically correct. correct. But continue. So, um, one con I had with the uh, story in particular is that I felt that the tension started to die out by around page eight, once everyone's at the dinner table. Uh, at that point, it felt to me like everyone's situation already seemed kind of set in stone. I kind of, uh, and, and uh, I kind of had, I, I didn't, I wasn't really entirely sure what was going to happen, but I didn't feel a, a tension anymore once we were at the dinner table because uh, Cecil was already uh, trapped and given the uh sort of the trend that uh that remy has in these stories i uh, i felt confident for mm -hmm. that point to this to figure you know well remy won this and uh so the next three pages i didn't feel too much tension and then on top of that it was a lot of you know that torture gore that felt uh, was a little too long for my taste but that mileage may vary from reader to reader so i won't uh count that necessarily as a as an objective con um i did also have one small nitpick uh, oh give me the nitpicks yes the nitpick being on uh page seven uh panel two where cecil's injury seems to be on the wrong side of his body from where he stabbed remy oh i see i um, get you unless, unless they unless it's supposed to be mirrored I haven't decided. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'll chalk it up to this definitely up, upon like other people's read could be seen as a mistake. But for me, I'm not really, I'm not really sure how that is a manifest. We'll see. Gotcha. Well, those are my notes on it. Well, thank you. And I just, I am blown away by the commentary and just the breakdown that everybody's put out with uh, this scar match. I'm really glad to see that everyone's giving Putrid their just desserts because it was really great to see their showing. I still am not over the fact that this is their first official battle and it was a scar match. Like, that is so hardcore. Yeah, absolutely. Don, are you with us? Just waiting on Don now. <laughs> I'm in, help, help me. I'm in my room. It's, it's, it's really dark. Do you have thoughts? Do you have thoughts? Hey, maybe. Okay, 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 wait, 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 wait. okay, hold on. I'm, I'm hanging on my knees. I'm sitting on the floor. Fuck. Okay, so. We're going full um, Blair Witch Project right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have thoughts. So, uh, Cozy? Yes. I hate Remy so fucking much. Good. I hate this man so much. I'm tired of him. Well, she could stay a little while. Where is she going with all that? That's my question. My phone is ringing. I'm not going to get it. Uh, that's my phone. So, uh, my, my biggest issue with the comic was 
it, it shares the same issue as buggies, wherein my phone will never stop ringing. And also, <laughs> it, it, the fact that it sort of starts in the, it, it feels like it starts in the middle, that there was really no beginning. If there was a beginning, it was just that very first page. That's it. Because all everything that happens that is worth calling a beginning is Cecil saying, this lady comes by, I gotta eat her. And then second page, it says, oh, there he goes. Like, I should have added that sound effect. It goes straight into it. And um, it's, uh, I mean, I love the rest of it, but it's just that part. Like, and then looking at the rest of the page count, it made, it made me go by the end to sort of, uh, that's it. Huh. Okay. Um, when Pyrus pointed out the the sort of set in stone fates of the characters by the dinner scene page, which was also, by the way, if no one noticed, that dinner scene page was a reference to Resident Evil 7. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Pyrus definitely has a really good point here that it is set in stone the fate of Cecil and with co with not cozy holy shit <laughs> Remy showing this uh favoritism towards Cecil it seriously makes me think like shouldn't you be censoring the comic pages Pyrus and my other thought dude was, Don is dragging the both of us tonight <laughs> it, it it was making me think like the most iconic comic from Remy was his heavyweight comic where it's revealed that he's doing all this heavily heartless stuff for his sister and at the end he's at a crossroads where we don't know what he's decided and this comic doesn't actually really feel like a follow-up to that sort of linear storyline if anything it just feels like a moment it makes me wonder why is why is Cecil why is Cecil the one who gets to live why did everyone else who has superpowers, who who has more punch to them, who could fuck Remy up or otherwise, or be his friend that he wants, why Cecil, the normal, the quote unquote normal person? I gotta stop reading the comments. <laughs> Snow is um, like, Remy sensed the stitchness in Cecil. You know what? I'm going with it. It makes me wonder, is it just Cecil? Could it have really been, could it have really, or could it have been like anyone else? Or was Cecil, or was his story just fitting to Cecil, et cetera, et cetera? It made me unsure of why, especially considering who Lou is and considering how their entire overarching uh, plot was about Remy killing normal people and other and metas and otherwise to collect their souls and then he lost all of them in the heavyweight comic and then now he has this new skull on his chest that supposedly does the same thing why why don't they just collect Cecil's soul I seriously don't understand sort of in comparison to the heavy actions that Remy has been doing in heavyweight that now he not only he gets to, you know, change up his act, but somehow he gets to change up his act and Lou lets it slide. Uh, there there was no real hint of this sort of privilege given before. Um, so in terms of linear storytelling and characterization, this comic does get a little bit iffy to me. Um, and it also just makes me think about questions that went unanswered post heavyweight of just well what happened afterwards because now we're skipping to this uh, what the i can agree it was definitely yeah. a skip and i did not make it clear but this isn't a linear sort of this is happening after armo i had considered it because i had some sketches i don't know if anybody uh got to view some of the post Arma ruins that I had and some of the background elements, but I decided to edit it out because all the stuff that happened with Heavyweight and all the stuff that happened with Arma didn't feel like it would fit with the encounter with Cecil, so I made this more episodic. I had a thought uh, Give me your thoughts. Concerning uh, what Don was asking about uh, Remy's uh, reason for choosing Cecil. Mm. I I genuinely came out of it believing that uh, 
that it was really dumb luck. Uh, Remy seems like the kind of person who is like the Joker, just the dog chasing cars. Um, I can agree with just, that. Just managed to find, just managed to find uh, a guy with no powers um, who has, uh, who seems to have no problem uh, with, you know, darker pleasures. And uh. Uh, like he says in the page, he was lonely. And metas are uh, t- more work than they're worth. I this is just me, I, and you can you guys can totally like tug of war this and disagree. Just I since I'm here, I may as well say it because we're on Junkcast. But I think that at least in heavyweight, uh, the encounter with uh, Swan and the fact that she is a meta and she asks like, "Why did you pick me? Why did you do this to me?" And his response was, "It could have been anyone." I kind of wanted that reflected with this encounter as well. It really could have been anyone. I see. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. I see both of your points, but I feel like you were both of those points are still ignoring. Even if he has dumb luck, even if it could have been anyone, and that anyone became Cecil in this comic, once again, that dumb luck does not. It doesn't reflect when you bring him to Lou. Lou is the hard objective character. She makes the objective decision for herself and for Remy. Remy bows to Lou. So now my question becomes, why did Lou let Cecil get the pass? Okay. And Especially, that was going to be, my, uh, that yeah. was gonna be my, uh, my, my second thought on, uh, <laughs> on your second opinion about why Lou allows it. I think it's been clear since uh, Swan at least I felt it was clear to me since Swan that Lou uh, lets Remy have these uh, little small pleasures as a means of control. Um, oh, I completely agree with you. I kind of do. And I completely also agree with Don if that isn't being portrayed right, that it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. I'd be more than happy to workshop that. But I think, Pi, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's a sense of it's a sense of control. She has him on a on a leash, and every now and then she gives him some slack to make him believe that you know that they he have, has agency. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how uh... I interpreted it, and it, and she's she's it's careful. She seems careful enough that none of these uh, little projects of Remy's ever s- seem to um, spoil her plans. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I suppose. I, but it's okay I, if you I, don't like it. I, I I'd suppose. be definitely curious to hear, like, if it doesn't work for you. It doesn't work where for I could me. Go. It doesn't work for me because the gifts that she gives, I don't know. It, it doesn't. <laughs> it, it legitimately doesn't sit right. Not not in terms of like morality. Like I don't care. I'm, like I'm I'm talking about in terms of like so he gets Cecil. But then uh, at the same time, he did have a girlfriend that, he, like, they literally killed together. Oh, so oh, uh, that make I can see why you would have that viewpoint. Oh, goodness. Okay, for like, those it, of you on Junkass that have not, I, like, read any of my background and may not have indulged in heavyweight, this may be a sort of unexpected clarification that, I guess, Don saw my side and said this is what i'm getting from it where is what is it that you just said that they killed the girlfriend together that's what don said i think okay um yay nay (laughs) i just wanted to confirm because uh what i was trying to portray in those black pages from heavyweight where those flashbacks are happening was that lou killed the girlfriend on her own to get her out of the way because she was hindering Remy from his higher purpose. And when Remy meets uh, Pombiki's character, Estrella, it, it's a... Uh, wait, it's not Estrella. What am I talking about? <laughs> uh, it's with no knowledge as to what happened to her. He just knows that she killed herself, cursing him. So it wasn't a fact uh, that they were doing it together. It was a fact that she did it behind his back. And he was left with the thought that, oh, she killed herself and cursed me. Yeah, Lou's feeding Remy lies and manipulating him from the start. Uh, it's all coming uh, out. Yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. I I really feel like with this in mind, then you do need to display more of Lou's character a lot because. Heck yeah, I'm down for that. We're, we're not getting enough of her character for yeah, me I to guess, wholeheartedly guess, uh, believe this. What, what'll work for readers is to get is to have readers uh, at some point uh, know what it is that she does want. Mm-hmm. Like all I know and is it, that uh, she has uh, plans and it's happens. incest. <laughs> well, maybe we might get some more with an upcoming battle that I see in the comics that are being drawn. Oh, yeah. I hear that there's a collab going on. <laughs> I'm just saying. But yeah, another fantastic scar match. The dessert to this whole three-course meal, it was amazing on all parties fronts. What is it? Buggy? Uh, flighty? Help me out, you guys. <laughs> Myself, Putrid. Oh, uh, there's, yeah, yeah and there's Jade and Snowy. Fantastic work, and I love the fact that October has just brought all the scar matches to the yard. I want to see everyone else get like messed up. I want to see more of this. But yeah, those are my final thoughts, and those are my final thinks. Does anybody have any last minute things to add on any of the battles so far? Uh, everyone, congratulations, please. everyone. <laughs> con- con- congrats. Well, please, zoom out the camera. Please. <laughs> please. I'm on my knees. More full bodies. Thank you. Congrats. <laughs> All right. Let me close this up. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening. I can't wait to grab another batch of comics and battles. So that should be not this week, but the week after. So... Get your battles in so I can oogle them and be like, oh, I want to talk about that. And then put them on. All right. This is us signing off. Signing off.